So um, if you're here this morning, you know that, that the, the, this evening's sermon is, is a continuation from this morning. This morning, I'll, I'll do a brief recap of everything I covered this morning. And the, the, the topic for conversation tonight, for the, the sermon tonight, is one of patience. We're learning patience, we're learning pay, how, how we get better, you know, more patience from Scripture and just kind of understanding how important it is, how critical it is for us to have patience in our life in order to continue further to make it through the trials and tribulations that, that beset us in this lifetime. Uh, I started off going through, you know, when your patience, um, when your faith is tried, you need patience to get through that when you have major bad events that happen in your life that can test your faith, that we need to have patience to get through that, to see that through the end. We need to have um, you know, all of our afflictions, whether it's our, you know, caused by ourselves because of our sin. Sin will bring us into affliction, into problems. Being chastened and chastised by the Lord is going to make us have issues. We need to be patient, patiently endure those things. You know, not getting upset, but just seeing it through to the end. Um, patience during times of trouble. We know we're going to have pay, we're gonna need to have patience during the great tribulation because there's going to be a time of persecution in our life when, when the Antichrist comes into power and there's going to be people who have severe persecutions against the saints. We need to have our patience ready to go and, and just, just ready to deal with whatever comes our way knowing and see one of the things with patience I explained this morning was that usually it's events that you have no control over. They're outside factors that happen to you, whether it's God chastising you or bad things happening in your life. We need to be able to deal with things with patience. Now, I didn't go into this a whole lot um, this morning, but what would be the opposite of having patience? Well, one of the, one of the opposites of having patience would be discontentment with where you're at and the things that are going on and maybe some murmuring and some complaining about everything that's happened in your life. Remember, Job is an excellent example of someone who had patience, someone who went through all kinds of horrible things in his life, had lots of tribulation and anguish and testing going on in his life, but was able to make it through and do so in a proper spirit and do so with patience. Another way, another um, bad effect of not having patience is if you're uh, very hasty, right? When you endure something patiently, you're, you're, you're going to have a better mindset of being able to, to deal with what's going on instead of freaking out and being quick to just, to just do something and, you know, kind of running around all nuts. That's not very patient, Right? Not knowing what to do, not knowing how to handle it. Oh, I don't know what to do. And, and that's going to lead you to bad decisions and doing things in an in a improper way. Patience will help you to take a step back, review your, where you're at, and try to make your best decisions going forward with patience. Not thinking you just automatically have to act right away, have to react. You may have to act, but the reaction is what you want to be able to prevent by exerting some temperance and patience. Temperance is controlling yourself. So patience will help you with that. And um, so I went over some other things. The, the main point this morning was when you're going through the hard times and the troubles to endure with patience. And then we looked at a few other things. Patience when you see wicked people not being judged by God. You know, be patient with God knowing that, hey, he's going to judge on his time and we don't need to worry about it. It's not our business. Just you do what you need to do. Um, patience while we're out soul winning. Patience when you're trying to learn the Bible and understand from Scripture and to gain wisdom that it takes time. It's going to be precept upon precept. And that's basically where I left off this morning. I wanted to get a little bit further, but we kinda, I kind of spent quite a bit of time on the, on the first part. But now we're in Romans chapter 15. We mentioned a lot about patience of issues and things that are happening personally in your life, things that personally impact you. But we also need to have patience not only during our own trials, our own tribulations, but also with helping other people out. Also supporting other people, being patient 
when other people are in need. Because as a church, we're supposed to be here for each other. Look at verse number one of Romans 15. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. If you're someone who's strong, you're strong in the faith, you, you are cemented, you're grounded. You know what? In church and, and, and among believers, you're going to have people who are not so strong. You have people who are weaker. And it says here that the strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, ought to help those that are weaker out. Hey, you're that rock. You're trying to help them out and to, and to just continue to help them and not to please ourselves and just be so focused about ourselves. Well, I'm strong. I've got everything figured out. Nuts to them that don't have everything figured out. That is not the Christian attitude. That's not the attitude we ought to have. And just say, just let them figure it out. No, we ought to, you're strong, they're weak, we ought to help them. That's what Romans 15, 1 is saying. Verse number 2, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ." God is a God of patience and consolation. Consolation is consoling and comforting. And that is what we are supposed to be towards those that are weak. Help bearing their infirmities. Now look, it does require patience. Sometimes you have people that have a lot more need than other people. And you might have this attitude of saying, well, you know, so-and-so is just really needy, needy, needy. You know, well, look, are they weak and we're strong? You need to have patience with those that might be a little bit weaker. I don't understand why they have such a problem with X, Y, or Z. I took care of that a long time ago. It wasn't that big of a deal for me. Yeah, but it's a big deal for them. And you ought to be patient enough to, let the, to help them out, to comfort them, to console them, and to get them through their difficult trials and tribulations. That's what we're here for as a church, Amen. to help the people out. They need patience going through their hard times and we need patience helping out those going through their hard times. Because let's face it, if you're helping someone else, it's always going to be an inconvenience for you. Always. I mean, it, when is it not an inconvenience to help somebody else out? We all have our own things that we want to do with our time. Sometimes I just want to sit on my couch. Sometimes I just want to get this done. Sometimes I want to get this done. But if you're going to help someone else out, it's always going to inconvenience you. Always. What if Jesus had your attitude and just said, you know, I'm not talking to anyone in particular, but <laughs> so I'm not pointing at Brother Roberts with this, but <laughs> what, if, what if Jesus had the attitude of just saying, hey, just get over it. Oh, I'm not going to support the weak. Oh, I'm not going to help people. Look, I got things I want to go do. I want to go fishing and have some fun. I want to go camping. I've got some other work that I want to, you know what, forget you guys. Is that the attitude that Christ left for us? Of course not. He gave his life for other people. It was never about him. And sometimes we get such an attitude that you just have to help someone out one time and oh man, I can't believe this. And you're bitter and murmuring and everything else. You need patience. Patience. Get the right spirit to help to bear the infirmities of the weak. If you're strong, praise God for your strength. And use that strength to help bear the infirmities of the weak. Let's all be strong. In order for everyone to be strong, we need, to, we need to, to help those that are not as strong and bear those infirmities. Now, obviously, there's some points where 
where you might have a per, you know, in, in, in churches, you know, you have people that just want to come and just always looking for money and handouts and stuff. That's not what I'm talking about here. That's not the type of person I'm talking about that's just, you know, their heart's not in the right place. They're not trying to serve God or do anything like that. But people who are, you know, an active member of the body trying to, trying to help and serve the Lord that are weak, we ought to support those people for sure. I mean, I get phone calls. Well, I don't know if we don't get them all the time anymore, but for a while, when we got the big ad in the, in the yellow pages, we look like some real big church, and then people are just constantly just asking for money, asking for money. You know, it's like, we're not just going to you know, just open up. Oh, sure, yeah, we're just, it's just free money. Come and take it. I mean, it's not why we exist. That's not even a godly thing to do. Just, just give money to everybody that asks you. No matter what, just, here you go. We all worked really hard for this, but you guys just all take it. That's not what the Bible talking about necessarily when it's talking about supporting the weak. But we need, to, we need to have patience when you're the one that's weak to get through your time, but also when you're helping those that, that have the infirmity, that you can be patient towards them. For, uh, turn, if you would, to Matthew 18. I'll read for you from 1 Thessalonians 5.14. I'm not going to go too far on that one topic because I preached an entire sermon called, I think it's called Support the Weak, just recently, not that long ago, about a month ago. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak. And then after that, it says, Be patient toward all men. We ought to have a spirit of patience, enduring, long-suffering while we're helping and comforting and supporting. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Now this type of attitude, it, it actually makes a lot of sense. This could be applied very easily to children. You think about it. You know, parents ought to be patient with their children. Here, I believe in the context, you know, it's all about supporting the weak. It's probably talking about adults, people who are, you know, that, that are just weaker Christians and things like that. But children are weak. Children need a lot of help. They need a lot of instruction. They need a lot. They need a lot. They demand a lot of attention. Raising children, you need to be patient with your children because a lot of things they're ignorant of, they just don't know, they make a lot of mistakes. They need your help and guidance. And in order to give that to them effectively, we need to be patient with it. Because if you're impatient, what's going to happen? Uh, what are the results of being impatient with children? You may be real quick to snap and make those, those hasty decisions, right? The, the illogical ones where you're not taking the time to say, wait, what's the appropriate response here? It's just a reaction instead of an appropriate action. You may be saying things that you shouldn't be saying, right? Um, um, ridiculing, you know, whatever. What, whatever. Whatever things come as a result of just not having the patience to deal with the weak or even your children or whatever. Patience is a, is a very important attribute to have. And it's not, it's not easy. Like, I get it. And, and the more, especially with kids, you get everything, you know, there's dirty diapers over here. There's screaming over here. There's water running over there. There's, you know, and I, this, is, this is firsthand in our house. There's chaos, like, all the time. And when you have chaos going on, there's stress just going through the roof. But even in those trials and temptations, and tribulations, even if they seem, when you take a step back, you could say, well, you know what, it's relatively minor. But when you're in the middle of it, it's not minor. <laughs> Everything's going crazy. We need to train ourselves because this doesn't necessarily come naturally. It doesn't come naturally. Not necessarily. It doesn't come naturally to be patient in dealing with the things, to be able, you know, you may have to act quickly, but without patience, you're more prone to reacting instead of acting appropriately. We need to have patience. You're in Matthew 18. 
patience towards others, whether it be children, whether it be other people, you know, supporting the weak, requires, requires an attitude or a spirit of compassion and pity. We ought to be patient towards others even if they have wronged us or they owe us. Matthew 18 is going to teach us that. Look at verse number 21. Matthew 18, verse number 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. What's he asking for? He's asking for more time. Patience. Right? Don't... Add, don't it, now, in this situation, in this story, the servant was in the wrong. He owed this, all this money unto, unto his creditor, unto his Lord, right? And he didn't have the money to pay him. He should have been able to pay him. It was his responsibility to pay him. So his Lord's doing what's in his proper authority to say, okay, well, you, you know, you don't, you're not able to pay me, so you're going to be sold, you're, you know, everything you have, and I'm going to collect that payment in this way. But he pleads with them, and he begs them, and he asks them, you know, have patience with me. Give me some time. Deal with me with some compassion. Right? I mean, that's, that's what's going on in this story when he asks them to have patience. I will pay thee all. And he's saying, I'll, I'll take care of it, but have patience with me. Verse 27, Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. So his, his servant had that compassion. He says, you know what? I forgive you. And that's a wonderful thing. He didn't have to do that, but he did that. He had mercy on him. He had pity on him. And he demonstrated patience. But look at verse number 28. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me and I will pay thee all. So the, the tables are turned now. The same man, are you getting this? The same man that owed his master, you know, it said 10,000, I mean, a lot of money. He owed a tremendous amount. He was way in debt. And he begged and pleaded and just said, have mercy, you know, have patience, please let me, give me some time, I'll pay you everything. Everything was forgiven him. He turns right around then to someone else that owed him. And it wasn't nearly the same amount that it was owed him either. It was a much smaller amount. And, and it's the same thing. That guy says, oh, you know, I'll pay you everything. Have some patience. You know, exp you know, extend a little bit of mercy to me and I'll make sure that you get paid every last time. But what does he do? It says in verse 30, and he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. This is a, a story obviously about forgiveness. And if you're born again, if you're saved, God has forgiven you a tremendous amount. That's right. I mean, a lifetime of sin right. has been forgiven you. So when people do you wrong, or when there's people that are weak, people are asking for some mercy, have some patience with me. We ought to extend that to them. And when we don't, God's really angry. And look, you, you know, I don't know if there is anyone in this room or not that's like this, but I know I've received help in my life quite a few times, and I've needed people to take mercy on me for things that I've done wrong to other people. 
And how wicked would that be for me to turn around and when someone, you know, similar situation for me just not to extend that mercy unto someone else. And that's what this is saying. We need to have patience towards others. Especially those that are in need, those that are weak, those that need help. Have patience. Amen. Turn, if you would, to Ecclesiastes 7. We're going to spend a little bit of time here in Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. We're going to look at some more of the attributes now that are vital to having patience. We saw that we need to be, um, have pity, compassion, right? Caring for other people in order to be patient. And obviously each circumstance of, of, of utilizing the, the virtue of having patience is slightly different depending on the context that it's, that it's needed for. So when it's talking about in terms of someone else, obviously we need some compassion and things like that in order to have patience with them. Um, being patient also requires humility. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse number 8, the Bible reads, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. So it's comparing and contrasting those that are patient in spirit being better than those that are proud in spirit. So when you're, when you're patient, right? I mean, proud is someone who's lifted up. It's all about them, right? They're focused on self. When you're humble, it's a lot more likely for you to be patient, to, to be able to have the patience that's, that's required. Um, and then in verse 9, it says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. And this is another, you know, when people aren't patient, one of the most common emotions to come up is anger, right? It could be anger directed at yourself. It could be anger just directed in general of, of why is this happening? It could be anger at somebody else, right? Well, someone else is in weak. Oh, you're putting me off. You know, you're not being patient with them. You get angry at that person. When things go wrong in your life, right? You're going to get angry at wherever you think the source of these problems is. You might even end up just getting angry at yourself. Oh man, why do I just keep screwing this up or whatever, right? When you don't have patience. You know, I work on projects sometimes and a lot of times at home trying to fix things or whatever. And it can be easy to get kind of angry like, oh man, every single time I do this, I screw it up. You know, that's not being very patient. You, know, you need to even be patient with yourself in those situations. When you aren't patient, you're going to cause more problems. Regardless of the situation, whether it's with yourself, someone else, you know, God bringing things on you, whatever it is, you do not make anything better by not being patient. Be not hasty in thy spirit. Hasty is just quickly doing things. It says quickly to be angry. Be not hasty to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. The opposite of having patience, I believe, is, having, is being hasty. Just, just acting quickly, doing things too fast. Um, attributes vital to having patience, you need to have dil diligence. Diligence, paying attention to every last thing. When you're not patient, maybe you have a long you know, a process you have to do, and in order to do it right, you've got to be really paying attention, watching everything. Well, in order to be diligent, you need to have patience, right? And if you're not watching everything, there's a lot more tendency for stuff to go wrong. Um, when you just want to be hasty and not monitoring everything that you ought to be diligent about. Um, taking time to, to teach your children is something you have to be diligent with. It's something you have to make sure this gets done. Make sure they get this teaching and this teaching, you know, and, and, and make sure it's all happening. And if you, if you don't have the patience to be diligent and teach those things. Turn, if you want, to Proverbs 21. If you don't have the patience to be diligent to teach those things, you'll be hasty of trying to just get to the end and just skip through it and not making sure it's being done. And then, obviously, that's not being patient. And then you're going to end up with not everything being taught, not raising your children properly, you know, the, the outcomes of being hasty because you're not patient um, they're going to, and they don't always show up right away. Sometimes they're going to show up later on down the road. 
as a result of your hastiness. Proverbs 21, verse number five, the Bible says, the thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of everyone that is hasty only to want. This is talking about at your working. When you're at work, the thoughts of the diligent, you're, you're considering everything, you're making sure every task is getting done, your job's getting done exactly the way it's supposed to be. Hey, the thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness. You'll, you'll reap and be rewarded for that diligence, for that patience of, of making sure everything gets done. But the hasty, everyone that is hasty only to want, just wanting to get it done, I don't care if it's done right, doesn't matter, that's going to bite you in the long run. Be patient in your labor. You can only be diligent through patience and not willing to cut corners because you're patient and not hasty. Patience in the Christian life. We need to be maintaining works and maintaining our faith until the end. In order, turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 6, please. Hebrews chapter 6. Similar to what we just read here in Proverbs 21 about the thoughts of the diligent and those that are versus those that are hasty. In order to have patience, you can't be lazy. You might think that the lazy person has all kinds of patience. But I actually don't think that that's true. See, God has made promises to us, but we need to patiently endure to receive those promises. Now look at Hebrews 6, verse number 10. Hebrews 6, verse number 10, the Bible reads, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. What's Hebrews 6 telling us here? Saying, look, God's not unrighteous. Like you're doing, if you're doing all this work for God, you're living a righteous life, God's not unrighteous to forget the work that you've done for him. He will reward you for it. Your labor of love, it says here. And that you have ministered to the saints. You've been a servant to them. You've helped them out. You've gone out of your way to help other people out. God sees that. And he's not unrighteous to forget your work. He sees it. Um, he says, we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. We maintain that hope, maintain that diligence in continuing in that work unto the end. He says that you be not slothful, lazy, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Through our faith, knowing that God will reward us and the patience to continue along, we shall inherit the promises, the promises of, of rewards, the promises of the judgment seat of Christ. And then he brings up Abraham, which is a great example of someone that had faith, not seeing it. God made a promise to him and, and walked by faith until he ultimately received the promises. But he had to be patient. He had to be very patient. Abraham's a great example of this, even though he stumbled and had a lapse of faith at one point. Remember, God promised unto Abraham and Sarah to have their son, to have Isaac. It's a promise. But what happened? He started getting older and older and older and became an old man and still didn't receive that promise. But he was walking by faith and he, and he continued along the path. Now, he had that lapse in faith when, when Ishmael was born and tried to take things in his own, man, in his own hands and, and a lot of things got screwed up, a lot of relationships screwed up. Um, you know, it's not the way that God had planned. But ultimately, in the end, Abraham still patiently endured and received Isaac, his son, at the very end. And, um, and we need to maintain our own patience and not get sidetracked 
from God's plan and especially from God's promises. I mean, God's promises are sure. There is no reason to doubt that, no reason to think that God will not stay true to his, to his uh, promises. Turn if you to James chapter 1. Actually, yeah, go ahead and turn. You're in Hebrews. Turn to James 1, and we're going to go back to Proverbs and Ecclesiastes after that. Another attribute, vital attribute associated with having patience is temperance. Temperance is, is being in control. You know, obviously, if you're hasty and just acting rashly, you're not in control of yourself. You're, just, you're reacting instead of acting. It's the same thing, um, this, this idea of having temperance. You have to be patient to control yourself and have temperance. Control your emotions and don't be so quick to speak. James 1.19, the Bible says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. You need to be patient with things that anger you. And this could be a whole host of things. The first example I gave this morning was, you know, with road rage. Right? Well, you need to have temperance to control yourself, to not just overly react. And you need the temperance to have the patience to make it through without just reacting inappropriately. What about annoying habits maybe that people have? Especially people that are close to you, spouses, you know, whatever. You're living with someone and if someone just keeps doing something and it's bothering you, look, you need to be able to control yourself and not just lash out in anger and, and, and you know, you need to be slow to wrath, slow to speak. This is swift to hear. Um, have, show long-suffering with your spouse, with family members, with new believers. Or there's a lot of people that can do things that can rub you the wrong way. Other church members. We need to have patience with people. And be in control of yourself. Have, show tem temperance. Be long-suffering. And, um, and not allow the, the anger to, to make you not be patient anymore. Turn, if you would, to... Um, we to Ecclesiastes 5. We're almost done. I only got a couple more points. I'm going to read for, for, for you from Proverbs 14, 29. The Bible says, He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. And, you know, part of having patience is, is not being so quick to react and quick to respond. And this has come up quite a bit lately, but it's, a, it's kind of a common problem in our, in our day today is with, you know, with social media and people being so quick to attack, quick to respond, quick to just, everyone wants to throw out their, their own opinions on everything, like right up to date, right up to the minute. Like you just have to, what's the latest thing? Oh, I want to say something about this now. When it would behoove a lot of people to just withhold some judgment for a little while and wait to hear everything before just making public proclamations about everyone and everything and, you know, whatever is going on. Amen. That requires a little patience to just take a step back and just say, I'm going to wait a second and hear the whole matter and hear everything that's going on first before I make a judgment because you don't want to just make hasty judgments. The Bible says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it is folly and shame unto him. It's a verse that, that comes to my head. I mean, this comes to my head every time we're out soul winning because so many people, like, you, you, you show up at their door before you could even open up your mouth, not interested. Didn't even give a chance to say one word. Well, that's folly and shame. I mean, and it really is, especially in that context. Think about it. We're bringing eternal life, a free gift. And they're answering a matter before they've even heard any of it. Imagine the, the I mean, I, I could only imagine what's going to happen 
on Judgment Day for people that, that never end up getting saved, that do things like that. It, I mean, how foolish. You just, just flushed your soul down the toilet because you weren't even willing to listen. But it's not just with soul winning. I mean, this is just, you don't want to have, the Bible says that if you're hasty of spirit, you exalt folly. You're going to end up doing foolish things when you just react real quickly. We ought to have some patience and, and be able to say, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hear it all out and then make my judgment. And not just jump on every bandwagon out there. Amen. And those that are hasty of spirit, you know what that leads to? A mob mentality. Amen. It is. People just lifting up their pitch. Oh, oh man, this is going on. I'm, I'm going to get in on this. I'm going to get on this. Not even knowing the whole matter. And then just, just jumping on board. Yep. And exalting folly and leading to destruction. <laughs> Instead of being a little patient... And say, well, hold on a second. I want to actually think about this for a minute before I just jump on this bandwagon. Your Ecclesiastes chapter 5, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. And this is refer referencing going to church, right? He's saying it's, it's way more important for you just to come and listen and learn than it is to bring your sacrifices. The way that we apply this today is, you know, the people that, that they live their life, they're living off in sin or whatever, but then they think that by opening up their wallet and, and giving some big, sa oh, I sacrificed a lot of money today. God's going to see my great sacrifice and think that that's somehow going to get you in, in good standing with God because you laid out this great sacrifice. Say, you know what? It's way more profitable for you just to, just to come with an, with an ear. Just listen. Receive the instruction because God's not looking for your sacrifice. God made the sacrifices for you. God wants your obedience. God wants you to listen. God wants you to hear. So come with a, a ready hear. Be ready to hear than just to give your sacrifice of fools. The sacrifice, the, the, when I read this verse, it makes me think of the, of the Catholic Church and the Catholics that want to go off, they want to live in sin their whole life, and then they bring in their, you know, their confessions at the end of the, you know, at, you know, they go out, get drunk on Saturday night, show up to church on Sunday with their sacrifice, whatever their money, whatever their confession is, and then continue just to live like hell. And, like, and that's their, the way that they live. And it happens in all churches. You know, it doesn't matter what your, you think your sacrifice is. You need to come into the house of God being ready to hear. And then it says, verse 2, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. People want to get involved in every mess, everything going on, and just blah, 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 blah. It's just, you always have an opinion. You always have to say something. A fool's voice is known by multitude of words. We need to learn how to check ourselves. Be patient. You may really want to say something really bad. Because you see something and your first reaction is anger. Your first reaction is whatever. Have the presence of mind. Have the patience to say, maybe I should just wait a second. There's been, I don't know, especially with the online thing, it's so easy to just... And then it's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Multiple times, and I'm, I pretty much just stay away from it altogether. But there, I can't tell you how many times where I've typed things up and I was just like, no, and just never, never click post because there was, I was being too hasty. Because the response was not appropriate. Because I was reacting instead of thinking and acting and exerting patience. Because think about it, I mean, when these things happen, why do you have to respond right away? What, what, what is it really going to matter if you wait a few minutes and actually just kind of think about it clearly anyways? Yeah, that's good. It's, it, it needs to be done. And we don't want to be known as a fool.
by the multitude of words, just blah, 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 blah. Proverbs 29, 20 says, Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words? There is more hope of a fool than of him. Last place I'm going to have you turn, turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Patience. There's a lot of attributes that we need to have in order to exert patience, in order to have patience. We need to be humble. We need to be diligent, hardworking, to, you know, staying focused. We need to be in control, which is temperate, having temperance over our mouths, temperance over our actions, temperance over our bodies, and uh, not to be hasty or quick to react. We're going to close with Hebrews 10. We're going to start reading verse number 23. Abraham is a great example overall of someone that had patience. As I mentioned earlier, he's a great example of that. Great leader, great man of God, raised his family and his household well to serve the Lord. And we don't see Abraham getting involved in, in these stupid skirmishes and fights with anybody in his lifetime. He's, he's kind of avoiding problems and, and, you know, getting through life in a godly way. Even Jacob, you know, when his sons, you know, when they found out about their sister Dinah, what happened? Oh, they reacted quickly and they were, you know, they just wanted to go and kill everybody. Jacob had a more sensical approach, but, 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 you know, he couldn't do anything about it because they just went and did what they were going to do. Jacob's decision was, hey, you know, yeah, this isn't a good situation. Yeah, there's a problem here, but let's deal with this appropriately. Whereas, you know, his sons went out there and just, just started killing people. Hebrews 10, look at verse number 23. We need to be patient to receive the promises of God. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Right? This is being solid in our faith. So during those times of trials and the bad things happen, holding fast the profession of our faith. For he is faithful, that promise. This is why we could hold and cling to our faith because as much as God is faithful, we can hold on to that faith. He is faithful, that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. This is talking about assembling together in the church. Don't forsake that assembling. We're here to consider each other, think about each other, and provoke each other into good works, to doing good, to staying on the right path, to staying doing right, so that you can maintain and hold that faith without wavering. Verse 26, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sacrificed an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, but call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of affliction. So this, is all, this all ties together. The reason why I'm, I'm tying this in so early on about holding fast the profession of our faith, considering one another, and then we get to this point where we're saying, look, you need to call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, after you got saved, after you heard the truth, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Don't forget about the afflictions you've already faced in your life when it comes to other people going through afflictions also and the importance of not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together and everything else. Verse 33, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions and partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me 
in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. This ties back in with what I was talking about, about helping those that are weak, supporting the weak and not being turned off by, oh man, look at the attitude that the apostle Paul, I believe it's apostle Paul saying, um, you know, you had compassion of me and my bonds. When I was in prison, you took compassion on me. And not only that, you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Whatever money it cost to, to bail them out of jail or, or persecution that came their way because they're supporting Paul or you know, people banning them or what, whatever the case may be, they took it joyfully. They didn't complain about it. They weren't bitter about it. They didn't murmur about, oh man, I got to help out. Why is Paul always getting into trouble? Why can't he just shut up for a little while and I could just do my own thing? They didn't have that attitude at all. No, we're going to help you out. We'll help you out, brother. That's what we're here for, to help each other out. And if, and if we suffer loss, we're going to take it joyfully and know because God is faithful and there's an enduring substance that's going to result out of the, lo the loss of our physical substance here. If so be that that's, that needs to happen. Verse 25, 35, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. There's a, there's a great opportunity. There's a great reward there in your confidence and your holding fast to that faith, being patient and enduring and maintaining that faith. Verse 36, for ye, ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. We need patience knowing that doing right in God's eyes and suffering and, and you know, being spoiled, having things, you know, being slandered, that there is a recompense, there is a promise of a reward with God. But to not let that back us off or lose our faith, we need to have patience. See, when you're doing right by God, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for the devil, for other people to attack you, people that hate God, people that hate the work that you're doing, people that don't want to see you grow, people want to see you out, and they want you to quit. And they want you to stop working. Those are the trials and temptations and testings that you go through. But you need to maintain the end result. God is faithful. These, these things you endure now, God is just. God promises and he's, he keeps his promises and there's a great recompense of reward. But you have to just maintain your faith throughout that and, and keep your patience and don't just give up. Don't quit. Don't just say, fine, I've had enough of this and let the enemy win. You have to, to, to stay through to the end that you might receive the promises. Verse 37, for yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Patience. We need to have patience. Patience in all aspects of our life. Patience with other people. Patience with ourselves. Patience through tribulations. Patience with God. Patience, comfort knowing God is true. No reason for our faith to be shaken. Patience not to be hasty in our words, not to be hasty in our actions, but being able to deal with things appropriately, reasonably, logically, no matter how much there's turmoil and tribulation, everything else going on around us, stressing us out and causing us to, to try to make some, some improper decision. Patience will see you through. Try to maintain a spirit of patience, a spirit of humility, a spirit of, of compassion, pity, and love for each other to maintain a patient spirit in your life. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, all the instruction that we can receive from your words. 
Lord, I just ask that you would please um, bless everyone here tonight. Bless us with, uh, with a, a proper spirit, dear God. Help us to, to be focused on other people, especially those that are in need of help, dear Lord, and that we can maintain a, a proper um, attitude and, and being willing to help others. I pray that those that are in need of help, Lord, would um, continue to, to seek it and, and gain strength and comfort here and, be, and um, receive, receive some strength by being in church and being among other believers that are considering one another and provoking one another on the good works, dear Lord. Pray that you would please just strengthen our church as a whole. And um, Lord, help us all to, to have patience. It's, it's not easy being in this flesh to sometimes handle the stress and handle um, the events in our life, dear Lord. But I pray that you would please help us all to learn patience and However that happens, it never happens through uh, good means. There's always hard times, dear Lord, but help us not to have to go through too many hard times in order to learn the patience that we need to have, that we could, we could get it the first time around instead of being um, continually subjected to, to get the point across, dear Lord. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.